Hello, hello folks. How's it going? So today I'm going to be doing a little bit of a update video using a map on the current Ukraine war. So I'm using the website uh, deepstatemap.live and this one by no means is uh, has been created or is managed by people who are trying to be objective in this conflict and the uh, the blatant proof of that is uh, the fact that the Russian units here, which you can by, by the way click on them and see specifically what units they are, um, they're depicted as as pigs, um, which obviously doesn't that doesn't indicate any sort of neutrality, which is it's neither here nor there. It's Ukrainians who um, are making this uh, this map. So I'm not really going to be focusing on that. I'm, I'm, I don't really think that's particularly helpful or practical, but uh, I don't know. It's just an icon. It's not super distracting. So the first thing we're going to be taking a look at is up here in the Kharkiv region. And as most of you probably already know, earlier, um, about, shoot, it must have been about like three weeks ago, uh, this entire green region here, including Bal from Balaklia, Kupiansk, Volchansk, this sort of area here, was retaken from the Russians by the Ukrainians in under a week. In what was a huge mass rout by the Russians. And initially, the, the thought was for them that, okay, well, this is not the worst. We retreated to back to a more advantageous position. And they took up a position here on the river, the Oskol River, as well as this reservoir. Very, very long and somewhat thick reservoir. So this sort of natural border created a defensible position for the, for the Russians and unfortunately they were not, or fortunately for them at least, they were not able to take advantage of that. As you can see in the city of Kupiansk, the Ukrainians were not only able to just take the city but also establish a beachhead on the other side of the Osco River, which in the time since then they've been slowly branching out in pretty much every direction and attempting to consolidate as much of this area on the river as possible. So it's almost getting to the point actually where forces coming up from Izium and Liman, that area which I'm, I'm gonna get to uh, in a little bit, have already at least, at least, made it to Borova and it's quite possible very soon they may close the gap between these two army groups and create one sort of unified front. I mean, really all the way uh, from ultimately the border here down all the way maybe to Lysychansk area. So unfortunately for the Russians, and, and there is more that is unfortunate, yet to come. This entire area here around the border of the Luhansk and Kharkiv Oblast is just a giant field. I mean genuinely a, a, it's a giant field. Farmland etc but nothing really significant. There's a couple lakes here and there. There's some rivers and streams but nothing huge to speak of. For the most part, it's pretty open territory throughout this area, and giving the Ukrainians a pretty straight path to two strategic cities that they would like to retake. The first being Svatove, which is located on a major, major uh, intersection between different highways, and it's a huge supply hub for the Russians in Luhansk. Essentially, you control Svatove, you control this entire uh, west-central region of Luhansk. The second one, and arguably more important, is the city of Troitske, which is uh, right by the Russian border, and is not only, like Svatove, a hub for uh, vehicle or automobile traffic, it's also a major rail hub, major, major rail hub, that actually supplies by rail, supplies all the way down to Luhansk and Donetsk area. So this is actually probably the most the most significant and the most important rail hub or rail supply line uh, for the Russian effort. Effort Probably the most important city when it comes to supplies in general for at least the Luhansk region. At least the northern Luhansk region, at least. 
And past that, you know, another city in a central location is Starobilsk. And, I mean, if you were to take Starobilsk, I mean, that's the entire central portion of Luhansk Oblast. But, uh, in order to think about taking Starobilsk, they will have to, of course, first take Svatove and Troitske. So, while they can, while they attack towards Kupiansk and uh, hopefully for the Ukrainians to continue on towards uh, the sort of rural northern or more sparsely populated northern portion of Luhansk Oblast, another group of the mil the, another army group went south and retook the city of Izium, which many people know about. In that city, unfortunately, they actually found large-scale mass graves, including uh, children, families who had been bound by zip ties, and many of them had signs of torture, many of them had been shot in the back of the head, uh, many horrors that you could potentially make an argument that constitute, that, that, would, that it would constitute genocide against the Ukrainians that the Russians are committing. Uh, the second one, arguably even more significant than Izium, was the city of Liman, which is a major, I mean, po possibly one of the most major railroad hubs in all of eastern Ukraine, was slowly and almost completely encircled by the Ukrainian forces, one coming from the direction of Yampil, and the other coming sort of up and around by these, uh, by these reservoirs over here. And Eventually, right at the last moment, a portion of the uh, Russian soldiers in Liman were able to escape. However, a great number were not. A great number were killed, and a great number were captured. So this opens opens the road to the north, which they've already taken advantage of, to link up with their forces coming out of Kupiansk, and also opens another direction of attack to the soft underbelly of the Luhansk Oblast. With cities like Kremina and Kras Krasnoryichenske uh, within reach, and furthermore, continuing to advance in this direction would put you essentially behind Lysychansk and Severodonetsk, and it's important to note that Lysychansk, at least from if you're going from west to east, kind of acts as a as a, as a form of a wall or fortification, a natural one. First, Severodonetsk, because Lysychansk is located in, on the high ground here, while on the other side of the river, Severodonetsk is relatively low lying. Low lying. So this would be a very good opportunity to encircle, or at least attack, the Lysychansk-Severodonetsk area from its more soft underbelly direction. So, just, just checking how much time I have left. I only have the free bandit cam. It only goes up to 10 minutes. I'll probably have to clip this together in two minutes. But anyway, so it's interesting. You don't see, report on the map, that many divisions of the Russian military. And it's not that, you know, Russian soldiers aren't there, but they don't have anywhere near as significant a buildup as you may think. They are not redirecting their forces. I mean, largely speaking, to defend against this attack. And it's it's very difficult to see what logic there is in that. Instead, what they've been doing, and this is something that's been heavily criticized by military analysts, uh, in including the uh, U.S. Institute for the Study of War, you have a large contingent of the Russian military, and actually, most of these are not really the Russian military, Russian military. Uh, this division is... This division is with the actual Luhansk People's Republic military, and this is the PMC Wagner. This is the Wagner group. This is a um, mercenary group that uh, that fights here in Ukraine, Syria, and also Africa. They're known for being uh, for hiring a lot of skinheads. So it's kind of interesting how they're using that and claiming to have a uh, sort of denazification goal in this war. So and you have the uh, DPR being Donetsk People's Republic. So most of these regiments, in fact, it seems that, or most of these regiments are not Russian and are actually with the main Russian army, and it seems that only maybe this fourth separate motorized rifle brigade even is. So, like, again, most of these people attacking right over here, 
as you can see by these lines, these are the directions of the text, are not with the main Russian military, but are rather with either the Donetsk military, Luhansk military, or with the Wagner group. So, very bizarre that these attacks still continue. And when it comes to the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republic, but especially the Donetsk, there's obviously a political goal here. Um, and this comes from, you know, the offices of Donetsk. This comes from the, you know, uh, hardline supporters of Russia out in these sort of areas over here, um, you know, who've been fighting for eight years long before the invasion. You know, there, there's a political uh, goal to take all this area to, to fully control the Donetsk Oblast. But strategically speaking, I mean, it's not really that realistic for them to just directly push through this. It, it's, a, it's a really bizarre strategy they've kept out through all, throughout the war to try to basically directly attack this back, the Bakhmut, Kramator, Slovyansk, you know, sort of area. I mean, this, this region, the U Ukrainian controlled parts of, uh, Donetsk Oblast all the way from Slovansk to Volodar are, it's probably the most fortified location in the entire planet at this point. Kramatorsk is half castle, half city at this point. I mean, it, it, it's, they're dug in. They've been dug in. They've been dug in since, bef you know, before the Russian invasion. Th this, this sort of reddish tinge here was how much territory the Luhansk and Donetsk People's Republics had before the war or before the Russian invasion. And in this area, I mean, in some of these areas, they've only been able to take individual villages right on the border of where the lines of control were at the start of the invasion. And in this area, they've taken a little bit of land. I mean, but it's really, when you consider how long it's been going and how many resources have been spent, it's really almost nothing when you consider it. And so they're relentlessly continuing to attack this area. Well, they're, I mean, they're being swept up to the north. It's completely illogical. And so it leads me to question how much, I mean, how much operational control the Russian leadership even has over a lot of these different units. It's bizarre. I don't understand why they would be doing this unless they're simply not under the control of the Russian military. I mean, unless we're, we're dealing with, I mean, an unbelievable level of incompetence which I suppose we can't rule out. So while they do that, just to the north, Bielohorivka was taken about a week or two ago, and they're getting in close to Lisi Chants and Severodonetsk, and it might even be the case where uh, if the attack on the, that area begins, or Russians even retreat from that area even before the Ukrainians manage to get behind the, them. So it... A bizarre, bizarre strategy. Even the U.S. You know, Institute of War uh, has really been criticizing them as uh, describing these attacks as, as actually pointless. Um, having said that, though, like uh, the Ukrainian defense in Bakhmut is taking a huge beating, Bakhmut in particular, and they're describing it as just just a hellish, like nightmare scape. This entire front, and I mean the Russians, uh, you know, Wagner, Donetsk, you know. Luhansk, all, all, all these different, you know, uh, Russian allied forces, I mean, they're really attacking hard and relentlessly. More and more every day, you know, I, Lord only knows how many men from Donetsk have already gone into the grinder. And whatever the Russian casualties are reported as, I guarantee you they're a lot higher than they actually are. Same goes for the Ukrainians, by the way. Um, so, that per mostly con concludes it for the eastern section. So, if we come around here to the south, nothing significant has changed over here in the south. There's just uh, an artillery battle going on in this area. Um, although there's a lot going on in this area politically, I I'd like to make, make another video about that. I'm not really going to get into that in this one. Um, over here in Kherson. So... At around the same time as the Kharkiv offensive or counteroffensive was started, there was also a counteroffensive attempted in the Kherson region, but it wasn't as successful. You only can see you can see only a couple pockets here were actually be taken at that point. This area is sort of around uh, Suki Stavok, and um, 
this area here near, near uh, Liubomirivka and Schmidtove. But really, I mean, nothing too significant until, until just today. Where there's a huge breakthrough in this in this direction, and I, you know, I sincerely believe this map is heavily lagging behind where it currently has it is. And by the way, that's something that the that the makers of this deep the deep state map make clear is the case. Uh, I've heard rumor and talk that the Ukrainians have already gotten all the way down to Beryslav. If that is indeed the case, that puts them in a threatening distance to the very, very important city of Nova Kohovka, which is, I mean, really, in some ways, everything to the Russians. Controls this major dam here uh, by the Kohovka Bridge, which has, along with the uh, Antonivka Bridge, been rendered unusable by really any sort of vehicle. Like, you can pretty much just walk over them now. They have giant, you know, craters of HIMARS missiles blown, you know, straight through it. It also is the start of the uh, canal that goes all the way to Crimea and actually supplies it with water. So before the Russian invasion, and this somewhat was, I guess, one of the causes of the invasion, or at least something that made it, you know, something that elevated the temperature of the situation for sure. Ukrainians cut off the water to Crimea, understandably so. And uh, it was a huge, huge, huge disaster and drought. A lot of there was a lot, huge, I mean, massive collapse in the farming of Crimea. Um, so that's very, very critical for them when it comes to water resources. So, if it's indeed the case that they're getting all getting all the way over Ukrainians to Beryslav, that not only threatens the Russians in the sense that it puts Novokhovka at risk, but it also works to almost complete an encirclement of these Russian units up here, including the uh, 227th Artillery Brigade, 205th Separate Motorized Rifle Brigade, etc. It puts them at risk of encirclement. So those are the main sort of fronts of battle that have been going. Objectively speaking, the situation on the ground is looking rough for the Russians. Strategically, militarily, I mean, when you when you take everything political out of the equation, this is objectively a terrible situation for the Russians to be in, and they're and they're not really responding to it in any sort of way that indicates any sort of thought, frankly. In the north here, there has been constant shelling of the border regions, but no sort of offensive. There has been concern from the Ukrainian side in this sort of northwestern area that there may be an attack coming from Belarus, and I think that's quite likely in the future. There are some army buildups here, as they call it, places of concentration of illegal armed formations of the self-proclaimed Republic of Belarus. Uh, I guess they're memeing on Belarus, basically saying they have about the same status as an independent country as Donetsk or Luhansk, people's republics, which is, I mean, I don't know. If, they, if Belarus was a puppet puppet of Russia their troops would already be in the battle. Obviously, Russia has significant control over Belarus, but if they were truly a puppet in the same sense, they'd already be involved. Or they'd already be, like, directly in the fighting. Not just having had allowed the Russians to attack through their country. So, there's significant construction of defensive lines here, and they are preparing for the potential worst coming from Belarus. Who knows what the future will hold when it comes to that, but the situation is looking fairly rosy for the Ukrainians. Obviously, there's some uh, political monkey wrenches for both sides, and I will be talking about that a little later. Thank you all for coming in, and uh, stay safe out there.